Hello, I'm Derek. And I'm Elowa, and we're here to talk about your book, Derek, Create Space, How to Manage Time, Find Focus, Productivity and Success. We're going to look at this episode at the introduction mm -hmm. to Create Space. Um, and the book opens with two stories, um, which I really love. One of them's based in the Serengeti, and the second is in a cramped canteen, two quite different settings. So mm -hmm. take it away. Yeah, and both both true, right? They really sort of happened. And uh, so, yeah, the first um, uh, story in the book is about how I went to work for a big company, a uh, global company, kind of sh every shelf of every supermarket in the world has got their products on it. And they sent me to Africa to work with some of their leaders. And um, after about two or three days, I had an afternoon off and I got a local guy to take me to Mount Longanot, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, um, which was quite a hike. I only made it halfway, but, you know, the view was just incredible. I mean, not only were there antelopes and, you know, like if you're in Dorset, you'd see cows, you saw giraffes. I mean, it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, but, but beyond that, the actual view of the Serengeti Valley was absolutely extraordinary. And it, it just went on for hundreds of miles. And, uh, you know, it's almost a spiritual thing. You felt that there was just this limitless space, right? Um, and of course, that's where we all started. Right? It was 200,000 years ago that Homo sapiens began to develop in that area of the world and slowly then journeyed out of Africa. Um, so it's a very um, visceral feeling, I think, to stand there. Um, and I was just struck by how different it was to what most of our lives are like, right? It, 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 and and um, when I got back a couple of weeks later, I, uh, by coincidence, for the same company, I was coaching um, a woman from Moscow who'd come to their London headquarters, which was off a sort of ring road in London. And there was some big thing going on that day, so that it was very crowded. And we couldn't really find a room. We couldn't find any space. We, li we ended up sitting in the canteen. There was people sitting in front of us and next to us and, you know, harsh white lights beaming down us and kind of clanging of cutlery. Um, and every time we started to try and talk, we got interrupted, right? Because people were coming over to say hello to her and the, her phone was pinging. And, 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 and I was just struck by the difference between the, the sense of space that you had, not just physical, obviously, but just mental and psychic and relational, the sense of space that you had in uh, somewhere like that African plain, and then in this kind of works canteen, you know. Um, and what I sort of began to think about was that, and, and, and I didn't have this exact thought, obviously, this, this was something I, I worked on for, for a while afterwards. But, it, but those two experiences led me to the, in, the first insight in the book, which is for the first, we're the first generation of human beings in a thousand generations, because that's roughly how many generations has been since, since those Homo sapiens in Africa. So we're the first human beings in a thousand generations who have to create space rather than fill space. I just went, I remember when I, the first time I read that, I found that such a profound insight because I remember even in my childhood having ample time to be bored. And I wrote recently in an article, I don't think I've been bored since 1992. Right. You know, there's just, yeah. there's always, all our time is filled. There's always something happening and any kind of downtime or dead time that we would have had were on our phones. Or we're thinking, or you know, yeah. our minds are really busy nowadays. We've all got loads and loads to do, and there's kind of an, a sense of acceleration in our society now, yeah. isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And so we feel overwhelmed, right, and and feel as if we've got too much to do, uh, and that there are limitless demands on our time, um, sort of an infinite number of uh, things and pictures and ideas and data that are kind of bombarding us, you know. So unlike the man or woman standing on that plane, you know, 200,000 years ago, looking out into emptiness, right? Now they had a few things to do, right? They had to find some food and nurture their young. And, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure they were kind of chatting and loving and sometimes fighting, right? But actually they didn't have to do a lot of things. So they were human beings, right? Now we are more like human doings. Yeah. Right? How does the, that insight then apply to the conversation about leadership and business? Well, I, I've been working as a leadership consultant already for co quite a, a few years. And so when I got back, I, I began to see this issue of space everywhere I looked, right? To the extent that I thought, oh, it's my hobby horse. I need to be careful here. But actually, when I was assessing people or coaching people or with a team, 
somehow it all seemed to come back to that central idea of creating space, you know. So, and, and it was when I started thinking about that and how it applied to leaders that the, the set, there, are, there are just two main insights in the book, right? And the second insight that came to me was that you can only really either perform better or develop your potential if you first create the space to do that, right? And what happens at the moment is we think, okay, I need to do more, I need to achieve this, I need to, you know, become a better whatever, right? And so we think we can do it, but we're already too full, right? So how could we do it? It's like physics, right? It's not that, you know, you kind of fill a glass of water, you can't put any more in, right? It doesn't matter how much you want to put more in, you can't. You empty some out first, mm -hmm. which is very hard to do. So, so that's when I then sat down and said, okay, well, how would you do this, right, in, in a work context? I think the idea is in the book uh, apply to outside work. They apply to our relationships and, uh, you know, our friendships and our kind of, uh, if we're parents, how, how we parent our children and, and ourselves, right? Do we make space for ourselves? Because that's the thing that is often most squeezed out. But, uh, you know, the, 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 I suppose because it was my job, right, and I, I was doing that every day, I was thinking, how does it apply in the workplace? in business, right, in a big organisation, right? How, how does that idea of creating space apply there? I think that's a really powerful um, environment to play with that idea in because it's so easy to feel at work that you've got all of these things being delegated down to you or all of these responsibilities that you hold. Mm -hmm. It can so often feel like things are non-negotiable and that you actually can't right. let go of anything, that's that you right. have to do everything that's on your to-do right. list. And so it's, it's quite a powerful uh, environment space yeah to try to, 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 to explore to, to, that in absolutely. and the second thing i want to say is i really like that we're talking about creating space making space because that's a very active mm. verb rather than um a phrase that i hear a lot which is finding the time mm -hmm. I, you know mm -hmm. i'll try to find the time mm -hmm. but you're mm -hmm. actually talking about making it yeah and we'll get into some of the nuts and bolts of that but essentially at, at different points you have to sacrifice something yeah. you have to say no to certain things in order to open that space up Absolutely right. So, so the, 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 the book explicitly says the, the a priori thing you need to do as you approach your work is, is to create space. That's the first thing you have to do, right? It doesn't matter how important and urgent the other things are. If you haven't made space, you will be reacting and running around like a headless chicken unless you first step back and create space. And that's what and the book then is a whole list and different all sorts of insights and experiments around trying to do that. Mm. But you're right. What happens in, at, at work is that we, we think we have to do everything that's demanded of us, and so we just get on and do it, right? Whereas I try and flip that round on its head and say, no, actually what you have to do is say, do I really need to do that, right? Uh, is that a priority? Right. My boss has asked me to, but could I push back? And actually, rather than just assume we have to do it all, stop and be very interrogative of every single thing that we're doing so that some and sometimes you do have to do it. Right. And sometimes you think ah, this is pointless, but I have to do it. But the point is not all the time. So sometimes you have to you, you, you have to be able to say, well, no. Right. I'm not sure that is important. And can we talk about that? And, and as I say, the book is then full of kind of practical ways that you can you can learn how to do that. It's really for me about taking charge and taking control. And if you're not a fan of that language, then the idea of um, being intentional, and being very deliberate about how you yeah, use your resources absolutely. and your time right. and your energy. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because your space, the space that you have will be filled. Mm. Right. There's, there's, you're not going to get away with it. So the, so the question is, are you filling it? Or is someone else filling it? And in reality, it's always going to be a mixture, right? The question, I think what happens at the moment is 90% of the time, someone else is filling it for you. And 10%, you're kind of, you know, getting some kind of, as you say, control or intention around it. Why can't we flip that, right? Flip it around so that you're creating, you're not going to get 100%, but you could get 20 or 30 or 50. Imagine if half the time and energy you had was being controlled by you, right? To do the things that matter to you. You know, that would be very revolutionary. It's a very exciting concept and conversation, <laughs> as you can tell, because I'm getting all excited. So in the book, you talk about these four domains, these mm -hmm, four mm -hmm. um, aspects of our lives where we need to create space. Talk us through them. So the, the first one is space to think, 
and that's subdivided into three things. And actually, what we're going to do with these episodes is go through each one, right? So I won't, I won't labor them now, but the space to think with its three subdivisions, then space to connect, right? My favorite. Favorite. Space to do, which is probably my favorite, actually, right? And then space to be. To go back to the beginning, where we were talking about that, that those um, you know uh, human beings back in the the ancient days were were just being was a big part of their lives, and being isn't as part, much a part of our life as as it kind of should be. So that gives us things like you know work life balance and sense of purpose and and growing and all that kind of thing. And crucially, because this is a conversation that is about leadership and business, it's how being connects to. You know, make it makes solid business sense yeah, to yeah, do that. Yeah, it's not just uh, absolutely. In my opinion, the book is about being more productive, right? Because actually, you're more productive if you create space, and that's the kind of contraindicative thing. People think, well, what does that? You know, how's a boss going to take take to this? Well, well, actually, you'll be producing more, and it'll be better stuff, and it'll be the important stuff. So it's it's not about being less productive. Quite the opposite. Now it is about saying that as human beings we should have fallow periods. You know, and there'll be periods where you're more meandering and have less energy because we're a part of nature and that's how nature is. You know, but 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 overall, because it's more sustainable, right? You'll be more productive and more successful. Now you didn't pluck all of this out of thin air. There is data yeah, to back this <laughs> <No>. up. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk us through some of the data? Yeah, so um, what, what I did um, when I was um, writing the book is uh, I looked at some of the reports that the company I then worked for had done on leaders around the world, right? And there was about 25,000 reports, and I took a 1,000 of them, um, and I analysed them to see whether when, when the... Um, coach if you if you like was talking to the person about what they needed to do to, to to change and be better kind of leader whether they mentioned the idea of creating space now of course they didn't very often say create space but by lord there was a lot of kind of step back reflect pause gather yourself lots of synonyms for creating space um and in fact the the um the, the statistics are, are, are pretty amazing, right? What we discovered was really amazing, right? Because something like 90%, I think 93% of those 1,000 exe executives from all around the world had a need to create space of some sort, right? Something, uh, almost half had the need to sp create space to think. Um, a, about a third had to create space to do and deliver in a more kind of focused, productive way. And a whopping three quarters had to create space to connect. My you favorite. Know, favorite. <laughs> so, so I felt then that you know there was there, it wasn't just my theory; it was actually borne out. And these reports have been written by you know dozens of different consultants, as I say, from all over the world. So there was something chiming here between this idea I had and the actual reality of what life is like in it, as an executive in a business today. And then across each of those four domains, there are certain leadership capabilities that sit under each one. Can you talk us through those? Yeah, so you know the idea of, of that piece of research was to was to look at um, what it is companies want people to do, right? So if you think about the area of thinking, it's about decision making, problem solving, strategic thinking, creativity, in innovation. They're all things that you can't do unless you create the space to think, right? In connect, it's collaboration, motivating, influencing, connecting, you know, self-satisfaction, you know, all around the kind of EQ and emotional intelligence. Can't really do any of that unless you create the space to connect with people, right, first. And and then with, with space to do, it's about executing, mobilizing, high performance, managing change, transformation, delivery. Um, and B, as I said earlier, is about better work-life balance, personal meaning, sustainability, purpose, and, and resilience, you know. So it, it's hard to say, but it is estimated that companies around the world spend $50 billion a year trying to get people to do all of those capabilities. I'm saying kind of maybe wasting some of that money, probably a lot of that money, unless you've actually first stopped and allow people and uh, help people learn how to create space to think, to connect, to do and to be. And if you do that, hence the second insight of the book, which is until you create the space, unless you create the space, you're not going to be able to develop those capabilities. 
And I want to add in a, a kind of closing thought from me, and if you've got anything to add before mm. we finish this episode, then please do, which is that um, I've been looking at a lot of stress statistics, a lot of stuff around resilience, which you mentioned under mm. the space to be. But we live in a world where we are pushed to our limits so much of the time. We're overworked, we're busy, we're chronically stressed. And that affects us on every level. That affects our ability to focus, our ability to think clearly, our ability to make good decisions, mm. our ability mm -hmm. to even just get up and kind of go in and do a, a productive day of work. I saw a statistic recently that said something like the average office worker in the UK does two hours and 31 or 37 minutes work a day right. and the rest of the day is spent sort of faffing around really. Right. Right. Um, so mm. I think I think that's mm. why I'm so excited about this conversation and, and this theme is because I, it's a paradox that the more you create space, the more you actually get get stuff done yeah, and right. the better your decisions that's and right. the more strategic your decisions. Yeah. So um, for me, it just, you know, employers are spending so much money on sick leave. I think in mm. 2016 and 17, there were 12 and a half million lost working days mm. in the UK. And that just doesn't need to be the case. Mm. If we can kind of zoom out and think a bit more holistically about what we're doing. Um, Rob Bell, one of the, the, the people who I, I love his podcast here, uh, he talks a lot about how busyness is a drug that we're all addicted to. Mm, mm. And I just think that there's a kind of a bigger picture hook and, and theme running yeah. at yeah. play here. So, yeah. Well, I agree. Right. And, and my view is that, you know, our, our consultancy CDP works around performance, potential and well-being. And, and the, the, the reason why I think Create Space is such a powerful idea is because it addresses all three. Right. It can help you increase your performance. It can help release your potential. But it does that while taking very careful note of your well-being. Because if you just concentrate on one of those three things, right, if you're just trying to develop your potential all the time and not performing, that, that's not going to look good at work. Right. But if you're performing all the time, right, you haven't got time to develop yourself. And if you're doing both of those without thinking about your well-being and doing it in a sustainable way, then you know, you, you, you're, you're going to be in trouble, if not now, but, you know, then soon. So, yeah, I think the idea of Create Space is a way of unlocking both um, how much you're doing and how much you're succeeding, but also the way you're doing it and making sure that you do that in a way that promotes um, your well-being and also, frankly, the well-being of the people around you. Brilliant. So I look forward to the rest of the episodes and uh, Thanks so much to everyone for tuning in. And uh, any yeah. any closing words of wisdom from you? No, I, just I mean, lots. I suppose I should say buy the book, right? But um, <laughs> th there's lots of stuff in the book and I think people would find it interesting. I think it's on Blinklist as well now, so you can you can skim through it if you like to. Um, but we, you should create the space to read all of it. Derek, thanks so much. Uh, lots of words of wisdom thank there. Thank you. And thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on a future episode. Mm.